Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with American Resiliency, here with a report from the Seed Savers Exchange Conference. Top line information you're going to want, recommended plantings for resilience. Some of you may have already heard of this very tough bean, the tepary bean, which we're looking at here on nativeseeds.org, the recommended place to obtain tepary beans. People have been cultivating tepary beans in the Southwest for over 4,000 years. One of the biggest suggestions to take away from the Seed Savers Exchange Conference was for everyone who cares about seeds to get tepary beans moving into a much broader range. These beans, which are from the desert southwest, are now being successfully grown in Minnesota and are recommended to be established all the way up into Maine. To grow in more temperate climates, these beans need sandy soil. They don't do well in a rich or loamy soil, and they need to be shockingly neglected. Don't water these beans. They need stress to flower in more temperate, damp climates. They're going to be inclined to vine and vine, engage in continual vegetative growth without flowering or bearing. So you got to be mean to them. These beans have been observed to mature, flower, and set in one rain in their indigenous region. They are a fast plant. They go 60 days to harvest. And these beans are very healthy for you, these temporary beans. I mean, like, all beans are pretty good for you, but this particular variety has been established as especially anti-diabetic. The next recommended planting we're talking about is carried by seed savers themselves. We're talking about black cumin. This herb, which can grow in a wide range of environments, was being talked about for use in a diet to support human health in our hotter, drier world. One of the speakers, Gary Paul Nabhan, is a Lebanese-American man who wove deep connections in his speaking between the cuisines of cultures in hot, dry places. This was very interesting to me because I cook a fair amount of Middle Eastern food, and some of the things he was saying made pieces come together in my head in a new way. So, like, when I read about food history and look at domestic records from the Middle East, people were eating just, like, this insane amount of olive oil. Not using like a lot of oil in the household and some of it is going to lamps and cosmetics. There's detailed records. It was going into food. People were eating it. So Gary, who was bringing in these cultural history deep tracks, really put some pieces together for me on the level of oil consumption by our ancestors. He said that through eating herbs and spices ground in oil, that oil base would let the aromatics that offer protective qualities like heat resilience, resilience to desiccation, and some protection from UV hit the bloodstream fast. It made me wonder if the historic Middle Eastern diet, which was so heavy in oil, was in part working to mainline the medicinal properties of spices and herbs. Sometime, you know, as a skeptical person, looking at the potential protective impacts of this herb, and there is some scientific evidence supporting Gary's claims. For more information on this topic, if you are interested in this idea of using herbs and spices to support health in a warming world and to distribute cultivation of particularly helpful herbs and spices, Gary and uh, Beth Dooley, they did just a great in-person teaching, and I think it would be cool for you to check out their book. That book is Chili, Clove, and Cardamom, A Gastronomic Journey into the Fragrances and Flavors of Desert Cuisines. Okay, so we talked about beans, we talked about herbs, now let's talk oil. People in the Midwest and in the Northeast, we've got another conference takeaway plant, hazelnut. So hazelnuts, there are wild hazelnuts in North America. The whole family looks very resilient as we move into a more challenging future. And what I've got on the screen here is to show you that there are growers associations coming together to help bring this great nut to market with a focus on sustainability and resilience. If you're looking to put in trees that can make it long term in much of the Midwest and the Northeast, I've previously recommended hickories as a group of trees that are present now and looking great in the projections. Hickories are great. Hazelnuts, they have some advantages. They are easier to process, easier to get the oil, and easier to market because people have tried Nutella. So as a species, we now want to be eating hazelnuts all the time. Okay, that's the most important information for many of us. Recommended for broad spread, tepary, black cumin, hazelnut. Now I want to give you some more information about Seed Savers Exchange and how to get involved in their massive seed exchange network, 
which preserves about 18,000 varieties, more than can be found in all of the collected seed catalogs in the U.S., and how you can participate in what is basically the only major can I grow that trial happening now nationwide with a focus on climate resilience. First, a little about Seed Savers Exchange because I love them. I want you to check out their logo. It's like a crazy explosion, but every little element, every species represented in that image has recognizable meaning to people who have followed the history of Seed Savers Exchange. Seed Savers Exchange has some beautiful history. They just turned 50 years old. This nonprofit's work has influenced American and world culture in significant ways. Nowadays, it's totally normal to see heirloom fruits and vegetables at restaurants, farmers markets, and of course, on social media. Baker Creek, their major competitor, buys many of their scenes from Seed Savers Exchange and repackages them. People, just buy direct. If you can, buy from Seed Savers Exchange because you're supporting the OG. They're wonderful and their seeds really will germinate because of their rigid adherence to quality standards. Seed Savers Exchange supplies seeds to the U.S. Seed Reserve in Fort Collins and to the Svalbard Seed Vault in Norway. And of course, they also hold a duplicate of their full collection at their farm as well in Decorah, Iowa. Without Seed Savers Exchange tireless work over the last 50 years, so many more heirloom varieties and the precious genetic diversity they represent would have been lost over the past 50 years. It matters that we save what we can save. Their work has supported and even created local markets for heirlooms throughout the U.S. These are the markets that allow family farms to do non-commodity farming in many cases. These are the markets that have kept a place in the food system for the small, the beautiful, and the strange. Their work is why we have the diversity we're going to need in our gardens in these times of change. Okay, you might be able to tell. I'm kind of nuts about Seed Savers Exchange. And they didn't pay me anything to make this video. I'm just a fangirl here. So much of one that I'm going to join the exchange. I'm going to tell you about how to do that and about how to get free heirloom seeds in 15 seconds. Because the team told me, I got to show you all how to sign up for the quarterly newsletter before the next one comes out. It's coming out pretty soon. So from the YouTube page, go to the link tree. All right, we're scrolling down. There's the mailing list. You can get on the newsletter sign up here. You just type your email in. You hit the arrow. You're on. I'm going to send you four emails a year. Get you caught up on cool stuff you may have missed. I won't spam you because I hate that. And now back to business. At the keynote I attended, Legendary garden goddess Amy Goldman Fowler, who writes just beautiful books. Let's get some of these up on the screen. Her, the photographer who works with her, Victor Schrager, I think has just a marvelous eye too. This book on melons by her is a astonishing artistic work. Ms. Fowler is a very powerful gardener, but she shared that she started her grow small, like most people. And she says that it's okay to be small, that you, if you have even a strain or two of heirloom grown in quantities to share, you should join the exchange. And here's how to do that. Here's the exchange website. I'll put this link in the video description. You can see that they're sort of classified into groups and that to join up, you can connect here online. But because this is like a crazy old hippie type organization, it's not just online. The 2025 yearbook is out. Every year they do a printed copy of this giant exchange network. They've been doing that since 1975, and it's just a gorgeous book. If you list, you get a free copy of the yearbook, or you can buy it online to support the work. I think that Seed Savers Exchange's focus on physical as well as online records is really very cool, a special and meaningful part of their strength. If they accept me, you'll find me in that book next year, pushing a strain of Swenson Swedish that I have been violently mistreating under a variety of conditions for five growing seasons and selecting seeds from only the most delicious survivors. This strain of snow pea has a great germination rate and continues to grow, flower, and set over 95 degrees. It doesn't appear to care about drought, deluge, wind, or even being very seriously bent. It has a classic snow pea flavor. So the seed exchange there, it's a valuable place to connect with other people, to participate, and it is an exchange. Some of the seeds there are offered without money. Some have shipping costs. Some have some costs to offset supplies on the part of the grower. 
But what if he wants seeds that are completely free and to get involved in the largest national trial of heirlooms in these times of change? You want to be in the ADAPT network. So this program here, which is another link that's going to be in this video description, will send you seeds in your area of interest every year. You need to get on there like right in January when they release. And they've got an app. Scrolling down here, we can read a little bit more about that. In the app, you can give feedback on how the different strains did, what their flavor was like, and any advantages in terms of resilience or concerns that you might notice. According to several people at the conference, the chatter on the app can be pretty mean. As you may have noticed, I like to cultivate a pleasant environment here on the channel. If you're tolerating my pleasant environment, but you want to get nastier while doing resilience work, I get the impression that the Adapt Networks app is a great place to trash talk other people's pathetic grows. Now, a final word, and this is for the real growers out there, your small scale growers. I mentioned the Midwest and the Northeast. This is a call going out to the Southeast and Washington State. I know we've got some small growers on here in those regions. Seed Savers Exchange is looking for contracts with new growers in your areas. Get in touch with them if you're interested. Say you heard it through the grapevine after their 50th anniversary conference. And folks, I feel like I could go on for like another hour about what I learned at this conference. There was so much, it was amazing. Focuses on indigenous seeds, African seeds, traditional cultivation methods. I got to witness the most insane tomato yields I've seen in my life in a year where everyone I know coast to coast is like, my tomatoes are just terrible this year. The wizards at Seed Savers Exchange do not care. They grow more tomatoes on one plant than I can grow in a whole good year. Their scaffolding is just off the hook. Thank you for spending some time learning with me. If you're interested in this stuff, I hope this video gave you some cool rabbit holes to go down and let you learn about some new ways to connect with other people who care about these things. When I think about what organizations do I admire, Seed Savers Exchange is at the top of the list. If they're new to you, I'm glad I've introduced you and I'll look forward to talking with you all again soon. Folks, thanks for watching. I wanna thank the AR community because you all make this work possible. So here's a big thank you to the donors, the volunteers, people spreading the word online, and especially you all doing the work on the ground. There are a lot of us out there with our hands in the dirt. Many of us are shy, solitary creatures who, like me, find it difficult to go to conferences and be in strange crowds of even the least threatening humans. Because of this, we often think we might be alone. But we're not alone. AR has become a wonderful place for people to come together on climate resilience. And when I have the chance to share about other communities where we might have good cross alignment, I will, because we're all stronger together. AR community, thank you again. I'll talk with you next week.